welcome those of you who are at home and couldn't be here with us. This is the gathering place, and we are so pleased that you're watching with us online. And today, it is my privilege to introduce to you Dr. Barry Linhart. And uh, I said this the other night when I was introducing him, but I think it is good to say it again. Proverbs 25, 2 in the Passion Translation says, God conceals the revelation of his word in the hiding place of his glory, but the honor of kings is revealed by how they thoroughly search out the deeper meaning of all that God says. I don't know very few people who search out the deeper meanings more so than this guy over here. Amen. <laughs> Will you join me in welcoming Dr. Barry Linhart? Ah. Thank you, Rodney. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Well, you may be seated. How many were not here on Thursday night? Let me see your hands. Okay. I know some of you are probably watching online, but I'm going to share some stuff tonight or today or whatever day this is. Whatever hour. See, when you get into eternity, you lose track of time. How many know that, you know, if we just kept going where we were going, things just continued to open up? And uh, you got to know how to open up the heavens. It's uh, one of the first things that Jesus modeled in the beginning of his ministry. The first thing that happened to him is that he had an open heaven over him. Then the Holy Spirit descended. And so you realize there has to be a, a, there's something about opening up the heavens that ushers in a new reality that we've never, never seen before. And there's something that God is moving in this, in this time, in this season that's in this nation across the, the global scale is that there's going to be an opening of heaven for people that know how to stay in the, the, in the uh, value of opening up a place, that God's going to reward that. And for those that have endured to this point, I said this on Thursday, great endurance brings great increase. Amen. Great endurance brings great increase. Great endurance brings great increase. There's a lot of, there's a, I think the, the church as a whole is kind of limping because a lot of people didn't see things manifested in the timeline that they thought, and the endurance and the stamina was not there to, to bring the reality of what God was doing, so they challenged his nature by the, by the delay. You never want to challenge God's nature by a delay. <laughs> Just give me, how do I know that? I've been there, done that, don't do that. So, <laughs> That's called words of wisdom. Just don't do that. Because it, it begins to put him on trial when he's trying to get you to overcome the trial that you're in. Amen. So I want to start off with, uh, I had some great time. I wanted to uh, just let you know, we, Dr. Bob was with us. Um, when did he come in? T Tuesday. Tuesday, Wednesday? Yeah, Tuesday, Wednesday. He came to our home. I had a wonderful time with him. And I just want to say again, thank you, Dr. Bob, for being here at uh, our home being there in our home and not here, but there. And uh, yeah, you guys need to understand the value of what he is to anchor in the next reality and the next move of God. Righteousness and justice, the scepter of righteousness is what God has and he rules from that. And so I just want to say, you guys need to um, always continue to honor the value of what he's labored for and what I believe God's going to honor all of you for he heeding to the value of what he has spoken. Um, very, very powerful time with him. Um, love him to pieces, and God bless him on his time off, man. And it's, it, it's really, I, it's, um, as when I was pastoring, it's like, you know, you always feel relieved. Okay, I get a break, because you're just constantly going all the time, and you got to have the next uh, word of the Lord, and the sermon, and the teaching, and people, and, you know, all the things. But um, I just want to bless him, and in the value of him being, you know, with his son, and being in Montana, and all that good stuff. Anyway, all right. So, that being said, I'm going to, for those, again, let me see those that were not here on Thursday. Let me see your hands. Okay, I'm going to say the, this thing again. Um, I had, uh, if you remember, Bob had said something about a month ago that he was praying for somebody, and then the next day, that person called him. That person was me. And what's interesting about it is I had a dream about this house. And I'm going to say it, share it again, just because of the fact that... Uh, Repetitive things gets, gets into the value of who you are. But anyway, so I'm going to set some precedents again for the value of what this dream is going to um, 
define or begin to express itself, but you got to hear the foundation of it. Okay? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So, um, about four or five months ago, I got a hold of a book called God is Absolutely Good by Robin Bullock. Anybody ever had that book? Read that book? No. All right. Well, maybe I should start selling that book. <laughs> it's a, a good sales pitch here for Mr. Robin Bullock. Anyway, it talks about, in the beginning of the book, actually, I have it with me on it somewhere, but anyway, uh, it talks about the value of what Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 and the value of what, how God identifies himself and the movement of what he's doing in Genesis 1 and then what he does in Genesis 2. In Genesis chapter 1, he refers to himself as, it says God, and that word there, God, is Elohim. In Genesis 1, that's, that's how it got in, the God, in God in the beginning. You know, all the stuff that God, and God said and God said. That's Elohim speaking. In Genesis 2, though, he, he kicks it over to Lord God. And Lord God, if you look at it in the King James, it's capitalized. All the letters in King James, when the Lord God, meaning it's Yahweh, he's coming in the value of who he is uh, as Yahweh, right? Yahweh, God, meaning he's pulling this aspect. So I'm going to read something to you, and so I don't have to try to fumble over my own words. I'll let you, I'm going to teach this from what Robin wrote, if that's okay. It's just a lot easier. So what he wrote in the book was, there is only one God. However, there are many titles that describe his position, character, and authority. Elohim is the name or the title that describes a person of God in his fullness, the creator God. Elohim is the only name used for God in Genesis chapter 1. <clears throat> it is a title for God in his triune. It's Elohim, created God in his image and his likeness. Secondly, there is a title Jehovah, or the proper name, Yahweh. The title in the first recorded, is this, excuse me, is first recorded in Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. In the authorized King James Version, it is spelled in all capital letters, Lord. In Genesis chapter 1, we find Elohim, the person of God creating. Then in Genesis chapter 2, we find that Yahweh, or the Lord part of Elohim, is dealing, pay attention to this now, with the earth and the cycles of life. When the Bible talks about the garden, it is Yahweh about his planting. Seed time harvest. It's about Yahweh. It's, about, it's, a, it's this position, character, and authority of God is the part of God, listen to this, that governs. Say that governs. Life. Life. Okay. And death of all creation through the system of seed, plant, and harvest. This is why salvation comes. It must come through Yahweh. If death comes, it comes through Yahweh giving life to a seed that was sown, not Elohim. That's a, that's a deal. Pay, pay attention to that. If you get the book, it'll, you'll begin to unravel it. And so Elohim reveals the person of God, while Yahweh reveals the personal God and his strict system of justice. That's why the scepter of righteousness is, is so powerful here, is because there's justice in his righteousness, right? So, <clears throat> once you know the difference in the names of God, it begins to become obvious that when you find a word of judgment and destruction being passed upon the people in the Old Testament, it is always the word of the Lord, in capital letters, or the word Yahweh, not God, not Elohim. You've got to pay attention to that. It's a, it's, a, it's a huge key. It's a nice card in your back pocket to discern what's going on. So... <clears throat> Uh, it's always harvest, here it is, here's what the dream is going to come to. It's always harvest being rendered for some seed that was sown. Meaning, you have to understand, I'm going to throw a berry in here now, okay? You have to understand that when the Lord God comes, he takes time, it's on the seed, to bear fruit in the natural realm. He takes the time off of it and instantly, instantly it comes to fruition. I believe that when God was in the garden with Adam, if Adam was going to plant everything, as soon as he planted it, he would see it because there's no reference to time or something decaying. Eternity, we in time have the privilege to unravel what eternity has already done. See, I'm, I'm making you think already. I'm sorry about that. But see, time is the dimension for the reality of what eternity's already done. Jesus was always cruci already crucified before Jesus ever arrived. You, you get that, right? He was slain before. So, so time, he came into time and unraveled what eternity already had done. Everything's done already, people. Newsflash. 
God's not going to do anything more than what he's already done. He's done. And when a king has things in order, he sits at his throne. That's the protocol. So he sits, and he rules from his throne, because it's already done. Okay, let's go back to it. It was always harvest being rendered for some seed that was sown. Say this. It's always, it's always harvest, harvest being rendered, being rendered for, some for some seed that was sown. Seed that was sown. Judgment and destruction was not the intention for Yahweh because Yahweh made a covenant with man. Yahweh always allows men to live as Elohim. As he is, so are we in this world. As he is, so are we in this world. Listen, I said this the other day. I'm going to say it again. Just to bring it home. You know, salvation frees you from sin. But transformation frees you from other people's opinion, everybody else's doubt, everybody else's fear. See, sin is a, is a byproduct of being saved. But it doesn't free you from opinion. Transformation does. Because you'll get, you know, there's a lot of persecution that comes because of the word of God. Very clear in Matthew 13, that Satan comes and says, come take the seeds of the kingdom out of their heart. Well, listen, a lot of times think, you think that it's the devil coming to get you, and it's not. It's because of the word that was given to you. Okay, that was for free. You're welcome. Okay, let me keep going here. There's things flying through the atmosphere. Just saying. Yeah, exactly. Barry, be, be, stay, pull, pull in the reins a little bit, because I'll just go. So the law of harvest is the highest law of all creation, and it is also the base law on which all others work. Nothing happens in all of creation without this law. Nothing. Yahweh means... One of the definitions of it, the perpetual life of God operating in the system of harvest. So when God, when you give something to somebody, whether it's emotional, wisdom, whatever, whatever you plant into somebody, that starts in seed form. Okay? As they develop that, what God wants you to do is he wants to come into the value with the life of himself to accelerate what needs to be done. What we have a problem with is we ask God for things when we never planted a seed. That was feeling really warm and fuzzy, didn't it? <laughs> that was awesome. But here's what I love about God. I had a dream about this place, understanding the Lord God. The Lord God, just to keep it simple and, and, and not go into the depth of it, just go get the book. What God is about to do, because you have the privilege as ambassadors of this kingdom from eternity to accelerate every seed that you've ever planted. Here's what I see is time is closing now. Everything you've ever done, is, it's closing in the perspective of that the Lord God is coming to render the harvest of everything that you've ever planted. You guys have known, I've, I've planted since, what, 1970, whatever, 60, you know, whatever you started giving into the Lord. I've got a few seeds out there that haven't come back to fruition yet. Okay? But see, when you call upon the Lord God, he's coming to accelerate and take time off the seed and bring it to fruition instantly. That's why he can go to a tree and says, you're not bearing fruit? Okay, I'm going to shut you down. The next day it's dead. See, it accelerated the cycle of that tree. If it's not bearing fruit, then we might as well get to the end of what you're supposed to be. Oof. You're going to get to the end of what you're supposed to be. That's a good thing. If you have the seed of God, you're going to get to the end of what you're supposed to be. You're supposed to get to the end of what you're supposed to be. That's why God gives everything to you in seed form. I want to bring this back around what I was going to say the other day. I'm going to bring some strength to it. God, in his actual full, fullness of wisdom, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it talks about the value of, uh, of, um, of uh, Jesus bringing an end to the Adamic race. Have you ever heard people, oh, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, and you know, I, there go I if I didn't have the grace, and you know, I'm just a sinner, you mean you're telling me you don't sin. You know, Bob has taught it so well in righteousness, you just know how to kill that thing, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah, we need a little bit more, hey, yeah, you're right. So, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, see if I can bring it up here in one of my notes, i got one here in my wonderful notes, the uh, value of what, what is said there, I could just bring it up on my Bible too, right? Anyway, I'll, just, I'll paraphrase it. So, Jesus comes and he says, 
First was the natural man. Adam was the first was the natural. And then there was the? Yes. And then Jesus said, that was, that was, he's referring to the first Adam. And then he says this, I am the last Adam. Okay, stop when there. When the last M&M's in the bowl, and you eat that last M&M, is there any more M&M's? So that means after Jesus said, I'm the last Adam, there is no more Adam, and there's no Adams, no more Adams, that's over. I said there's no more Adams. So when you get that and you understand that, you're just going to go, well, wait a minute here. If that's true then, then let's think about that for a minute. If he ended the Adamic race, then where does that leave us? Where does that leave us? It leaves us as what? A new creation. We were born. The first Adam was made from the dust. The second one came directly from him to you. The umbilical cord that you were attached to in the last Adam, it got severed. And now you're born from him. That's why it's called born again. You follow that? I mean, that's a big deal. We've worn that thing out. We've heard that for years, and we've worn it out. We took the value of it out. Yeah, I'm born again. Well, praise God. What does that mean? I don't know. I get to go to heaven. Okay? That's, that's not what it's about. He's saying, I've ended the Adamic race, and now you are from me. Now I'm putting the seed of me in you. Now I get to grow you to the value of me. I've actually paid for sin. I've paid for every disease. If you're carrying disease, give it back to me. You don't have the right to carry it because he paid for it. He sees it as ripped off. Give it back to me. Don't think when somebody says you have it, hey, something, God, God buried, he actually believed that the stripes on Jesus' back, he buried every sin, every sickness and disease is in that grave. If you understand a thief's mind, the devil will go into the thing that's, and rip something off and try to fence it as like, you're supposed to have this, and God's going to teach you something by this disease. What a bunch of fill in the blank. <laughs> so you realize that the value of what God said in, Listen, God is saying, I'm bringing healing. I'm going to accelerate that. I'm going to accelerate that. It's not like we have to have more faith for it. It's actually an ownership deal. He actually owns the thing. Give me back my property. Have you ever heard that before? I mean, come on, man. God paid for that. He paid for that. He really believes he owns all diseases. He really thinks his name's on everything. I paid for that. Give that back to me. It's not even an issue of faith. You got to get that first, and then you, know, you got to know how to make that transaction. Okay, so when you get that understanding, we get the privilege to grow to the value of what the seed is inside of us. Okay, that's a lot of groundwork for a dream, man. Wow, <laughs> got, some, got some extra there. So what happens um, in this dream is coming off the Lord. So a couple months later after I understood the Lord God, and I started studying it out because how many want to have things accelerated in your life, right? And who doesn't want that? I'm so tired of, listen, prophecy is not only the direction of what's going to happen in the future, it's the confirmation of what you're becoming. Okay, now you are sovereign, and you have the choice whether you want to follow that through or not. Thank you, Dr. Berry. I thought God was responsible. No, it's you. See, got a witness by the train. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to come to the dream. So, uh, I was telling Jordy, I was saying, this morning we were talking about being, I was in the dream, I was right here in this, uh, in the building, and I was right in the middle rafter about suspended. She, she was saying something like, yeah, you were suspended, like, what, what, cables? Or, you know, this, but anyway, I was in third person looking down at Bob, and Bob was teaching on the Lord God. And when he was done teaching on it, he says, okay, I want everybody in this room to write down where you want Lord God to come, where you want your seed to accelerate. What is it? What is it? Write it down. Lord God of what? You want healing? You want wisdom? You want Lord God of whatever? Fill in the blank. And everybody was, they took out a piece of paper and they wrote on it. And they said it, and then he went around and says, what do you want Lord God to be? He was standing just like this, what do you want it to be? And everybody enunciated Lord God of what? And everybody went through the whole, he went through the whole congregation, person by person, until everybody was putting a demand on the Lord God. It's something about individual, but it's another thing when it's corporate. It's an acceleration when there's a, there's a body of people that believe that. It's not that you can't get it individually, but there are some things that happen corporately that will not happen 
individually. It's not going to happen because he actually believes it's a body. So anyway, once that was done, and everybody enunciated that, everybody lined up around the, the whole house here on the walls, went all the way around. The doors opened up. People started coming into, the, into this building, and you guys all at one time would say, Lord God. And when you enunciated that, whatever infirmity or whatever was missing on that person, it was instantly made whole. Instantly. And the line that was coming in here was crazy. People were just pounding, but we, you were all going, Lord God! And what was happening was, from the seed of God that was in you, this is how I interpreted that, this is part of it, the, the thing that was inside of you was actually to the fullness of when you say something, you see something. Because in the fullness of God, you, when you say something, you see something. When you're in the fullness of God, you say something, you will see something. A fully mature person, when you say something, you'll see something. When you say something, you'll see something. The doors are open, you guys are going, Lord God. What you were saying was, the Lord of life, execute the life that is necessary to make this person whole. That's what you were saying in the atmosphere. So what is God saying? This house is going to move into a different reality. There's a demand on dimension. Listen, it's not something to just study. It's asking for you to be something that becomes. You need to become that. A lot of people study God, but they don't give themselves permission to be as God. Does that make sense? So I wanted to release that to you, and I want to watch how God begins to move and expand that reality of what I saw there. And I'm just going... Man, there's some stuff here, people. There's going to be some powerful things that are going to happen. And you guys should be very excited. I'm here to encourage you. Because, listen, I'm going to say something. Pay attention. Here we go. Eric here. Listen, Rodney. Randy, good to see you, by the way. Very good to see you. Um, yeah. Randy, stand up. I want you and your wife. Stand up. You guys stand up for a minute. Everybody lift your hands to them right now. Father, we just release life into their house and their home. We, we release a great grace. We, a, we ask upon Lord God, come and accelerate the seed that is in the middle of their house, what they've endured, what they've planted, what they stand for. I speak to Randy for strength, a great grace that will come upon him, and the ability to execute in the days ahead, that the abundance of who you are will fill him, and the value of what needs to happen in this home that is called the value of who God is amongst them and in them. So I thank you, Father, for the acceleration of that which is going to take place and what needs to, to take place for life to show the fullness and the fruit of what is going to be necessary for the next season in their life. I just release it to them. Everybody who agrees with me says amen. Amen. Yeah. amen. All right. Thank you. Okay, now, listen to me carefully, because I've been around Charismania a long time. I have. I remember Catherine Kuhlman, I remember Kenneth Hagin, I mean, I saw some stuff. I saw some stuff. Just like Bob does, you know, he sees stuff, and you just go, huh, that's pretty cool. And it's one thing to witness, it's quite another, how do you execute that? How do you manifest this? So I'm, I'm, I've been accused of saying things very rapidly, so I'm going to slow down just a little bit for that long. That's it. Now I'm going to go back to fast again. <laughs> let, me, let me help everybody out in this, this house here. Just give you some things that I've, I've learned. I found out that a lot of things that we say that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, which is his signature. But what I have discovered is, is that the enemy didn't steal your things. He stole the ability to bring mastery to your own mind. He stole your mind. And the byproduct of that is you lose your possessions. You have to know how to bring mastery to your mind. I'm just, I'm just saying, there's a lot of times we get charismatic and we get, oh, God, help me, help me, blah, 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 whatever you fill in the blank. <laughs> and uh, See, we don't know how to be mighty within the struggle. We just struggle within the struggle. So see, your mind's got to, it's got to move to the value of a divine mind. And it's, it's hard for people that are survivals or survivalists to graduate to a divine mind. That's why we have to evangelize the atmosphere that when you hit this place, it all of a sudden erases every problem that you've got in front of your mind because of the confusion that you're trying to break through comes with the clarity of the divine mind. And so when you understand that, because when you say, 
when I said, you know, prophecy is not just about the future, it's actually, it's actually empowering you to become what the future wants you to be. Not sitting around as and don't change, but you got to become what the Lord is saying. You are going to become the, uh, uh, the uh, stewards of Lord God. You're going to accelerate people in their healing. You're going to accelerate what poverty has done to them and get it off of them into the value of the value of who he is. You are. You just are, because if the seed of God actually matures inside of you, you don't get the privilege to hold on to it in the impossible anymore. It goes out the door. You guys okay? I'm just in my intro still. I'm still in my intro. See, here's what, I, what, what happens. There's no need to fight the devil simply because a lot of times the devil is not the initiator of the situation. The word of God is. Oh, what'd you just say? You need to hear that again. A lot of times we, 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 we fight the devil on certain things and he's coming to get us because we feel the duress of something. It's not. It's because the kingdom of God that's within you has provoked him to come to you. It's not the devil, it's the word. Have a happy Saturday, everybody. <laughs> so... You, you begin to move in this reality of, okay, there's some stuff that you need to understand. Why, check yourself. Is this, is this here because the devil's actually coming after me? Or is this because I said I'm clar- I have clarity on the word that came to me? Because it says very clearly in Matthew 13 that this devil himself will come after that seed of the kingdom. And we go into charismania and we scream and yell at the devil and God's going, he's not coming after you. It's because you become what I am. He's going to challenge, just like Jesus was challenged by the devil. The first thing he was challenged by was the devil. He was the word. You guys get that? Listen, it took Jesus 30 years to steward who he was in order to open the heavens. That was really good, huh, Eric? It took 30 years for him to steward. God's going to steward. There's a stewarding in this house that's going to accelerate you to understand how to open the heavens. It took Jesus 30 years to steward who he was in order to create an open heaven. So that's a powerful thing to do and understand. That's why I feel like there's an acceleration that's going to happen. You know, you guys all in the front row, you guys are veterans in this stuff. There's an, there's a, there's a, there's an acceleration that's going to happen because you're still here. You're still here. God still has a touch point. Everything you've warred for, everything you've warred through, everything that is in a contradiction right now to stop it tells me you're close to the breakthrough of the value of what's going to happen. Now, I'm not trying to say that to hype you up in charismania, but I've noticed in the Word there's always contradictions to the next level of breakthrough. You always enter into something, why is this happening to me? And God's going, it's not because it's happening to you, it's because you're coming as me. (laughs) When you come as me, then Satan gets a little excited because, dang it, he's about ready to lose something. And so he wants to fight for the value of what he's got and what he's stolen away from you because I told you, he doesn't come after your possessions, he comes after your mind. That's what he comes after. He takes away the mastery of what you are required to become a divine mind and he takes it away. The byproduct of that is simply everything gets stolen. That's it. Then we put a high emphasis. See, we like to put a, we like, see, if you don't understand the endemic race, see, I'm going to go on a bunny trail, I'm going to kill that bunny. Anyway, I'm going to get that bunny. <laughs> The bunny's taken off. I got to get it. <laughs> if you understand, if you if you stay in the Adamic race, okay, if you stay in that lane, and you, and you say, oh, I'm just I'm just human, I'm just I'm just sitting there and I still say, yeah, that's what it sounds like to me. That's I just hate that. That means you're putting a lot of credibility in the fallen nature more than in the nature of God. That's what it is. And that's what it is. It's just like, well, see, see, when you separate yourself from divinity, you get the wonderful benefit of poverty. See, when you separate from divinity or giving yourself permission to be as he is, so are we in this world, the byproduct of that is poverty has the right to own you. Woo! See, when we get off this, this, this consciousness of this need-based mentality, God doesn't need your need to need your need met in order to find God. God actually planted the seed of himself in you. He's going after that. We need to evangelize the atmosphere, create the atmosphere that accelerates the seed of God in every one of us. Does that make sense? So, I don't know if I should just keep going on my intro or should I actually jump into my sermon. 
See, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give you another clue. God's people will see God's glory when you imitate God. And how you imitate God is you grow the seed of God in you. See, a lot of people know how to grow themselves, but they don't know how to grow God. Ooh, saying some stuff. I'm pausing there on purpose. You need to, you need to understand that. Charismania is really well known for accelerating the gifts, but not God. The gift's free. To mature the gift, it's very expensive. But the seed of God, that's a whole other deal. That's not, a, that's not something that you know a lot of people talk on. Listen, God will not give his glory to a company of people that are in a defeated state. Because, see, the kingdom takes you out of your defeated state and moves you into the original state. See, when the seed of God and your... Listen, this is... This is whew, if I could just, just drop... Just lay all your gifts down for a minute and let's look at the mind of God for a minute, okay? Because when you become the mind of God, when you become... This, this privileged state of, of being who he is, the enemy diminishes as a direct result. The direct result is the enemy diminishes. Now, see, we want a gift. We want to, somebody prophesy this thing off of me, get it off of me, yeah, Lord, da, 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 da. Well, let me help you. When you think like God thinks, the direct result is the enemy diminishes. That's what happens. Does that make sense? Yes. So God's not going to give his glory to a company of people that are defeated and are trying to always argue with the enemy. Because, you know, God can vaporize Satan in a second. That's not an issue. So, we, 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 we've learned how to modify our behavior but not mortify it. So, that's another teach. That was for free. That was, that's, that's for free. Okay. Now let's get into the message, shall we? You guys, that was a pretty good intro. That was a pretty good plow. To, let's plant some stuff here. Okay. The level that you possess. Make a t I should make t-shirts, man. I, I gotta I gotta start a t-shirt business or a hat or something, 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 something. something. The level that you possess in the kingdom determines the level of mental anguish that you will go through. I'm going to slow it down and say it again because this is very powerful to understand this. The level of the kingdom dynamic or the divine mind that you own determines the level of mental anguish that you will go through. I'm going to ask you a question. Did Jesus ever go through anguish? Yes? Okay. That guy went into a garden and had drops of blood come off his forehead. Do you know why that happened? Because he is at the depth of the kingdom that produced the level of mental anguish to do what he did. There are certain things that are assigned to your destiny that only you get to go through. <laughs> One guy got it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and so we have this privilege of understanding. Listen, I know I've seen a lot of things in the supernatural, but I've seen a lot of people leave the, the value of becoming as he is because what? The mental anguish got them. It got them. No matter how much Holy Ghost showed up, how much prophecy they had, they walked away. Why? Because the mental anguish was too much for them. Nobody ever understood that they don't know how to stand. You know, Ephesians is very clear. Sit in chapter 1, it goes in, it goes into, it goes into walk, and then it says in the Ephesians 6, stand. you got to know how to stand. you got to know how to stand. you got to know, especially in the days ahead, there are things that are coming down the pipeline. You better have some substance behind you to have the endurance to stand. And so there's a value in that understanding, but there may, there's going to be levels of mental anguish because you're deep in the root of God. You're deep... You're, you're committed to the kingdom. The depth of the kingdom that you possess determines the level of mental anguish that you go through. 
man, you've got to understand that. But that's okay, because it gives you an indicator, I'm right. Why is the torment on me? Because you're right. You're right. Get back into the house of the Lord. Let's worship. Let's get that thing off of you. But it reinforms, it, re- it, re- it reestablishes that you're in the truth of something. Otherwise, if there's no ang- there would be no anguish if there wasn't a confrontation. You have to have anguish to verify or something to confront that truth is real. Otherwise, there's, what's, what's your navigational point? Well, I'm just blessed all the time. I'm all the time. I'm just blessed. Blah, 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 blah. You know, no, you're not. You've been, tur- you've been learned. You've been trained to memorize scripture, but you're still death walking. You haven't become anything. True or not true? You know a lot of people. that do, They do that, and they walk around like they got it going on, and everything's just perfect. And then next thing you know, they're off down the street because they had some mental anguish or some tragic thing happened, and they walk through it, and they go, why did God allow that to happen? Have you ever known, I'm going to say this again, I'm going to pick up on Thursday and tie it in a little bit. Can I do that, Mark? Is that okay? Okay, thank you. So what happens is, there are, in the winds of death, you need to understand this, there are mysteries in that wind. Just like Jesus was walking out on the water, and the men are just freaking out because they're seasoned sailors. Come on, these guys aren't like, all right, I just got this boat, and wow, Jesus just... No, they've been out there doing some stuff. The fishermen know what they're supposed to be doing. They know that you don't do this or we're going to die. So Jesus is out there, walks on the water, and they thought it was a ghost which is a whole nother deal. Anyway, so when Jesus walks up and Peter says, hey, if it's all about, you know, who you say you are, bid me to come. Okay, he begins, he initiates, he gets out of the boat. Okay, then he begins to do what he fell. That dude fell looking at God. Oh man, you didn't hear me right. You didn't hear me right. There are people that look at God and they still fall. Why is that? Why does that happen? What is going on? Why was it that he fell and he sunk looking at Jesus? Well, he turned for a minute. Yeah, I know that. But God's right there for crying out loud. You would think you could be big enough to just stay locked in there. This is God Almighty. This is the guy that created the universe. And you're walking on water and you're going to fall because the creator's standing in front of you? What were you thinking? Because if you don't what? Listen to it here. Do you guys remember what I said? Those that were here on Thursday? What was my line? If your mind is not on the... Yeah? Then what happens? I need an interpretation. Yeah, you will be distracted by the immediate. If your mind is not on the ultimate, you're going to be distracted by the immediate. That's exactly. Peter, listen. God, this is just wild to me for crying out loud. These guys are witnessing things. Their boats are being filled with, with, with fish. They've noticed, and here comes Jesus. This is why, because that's, that's good. Listen, every time God takes you to another level, it's going to freak you out. It's going to mess you up. It's going to mess you up because you're looking at, you don't, your brain don't know where to put that. This dude's walking on water. <sighs> looking at the creator of the universe, and he's distracted by Mr. Wave. <laughs> Mr. Wave takes him out. That tells me he's, he's been in the sphere of Jesus, studied Jesus, but never had been full of Jesus. See, miracles don't change people, but it does require a decision. When power is demonstrated, a decision is required. Peter in the boat, or they're in a boat. Here we go again, back on the water thing. Boys are out there just floating around, getting a storm. They get all psyched. Now, the creator of the universe is over here sleeping. Think about it for a minute. This, this is the guy that made the ocean, he's the one that made the wind. He made the wood that you're standing on called a boat. This, this is the guy right here. He says, he's gone. I mean, think, come on now. He, Listen to me, they're in the presence of God Almighty, and they're freaking out. What's up with that? What is up with that? I mean, you know, if I was with him, I would, I'd say, say something. And he'd go, no, you say something. That would be my learning lesson. I'd say, hey, you need to say something. I, and he would say to me, no, you say something. But that's what he was looking for. What is he doing? He's proving that in the winds of death, there's a mystery here if you'll unlock it. 
Well, or you can use everything that came against you and you fail to open up the mystery. Now you're railing against God. He doesn't do it. He's sovereign. He, I don't know. His, his ways are higher than my ways. I got news for you. The mind that he has, he wants you to have it also. He's not threatened by that. He's not threatened by that. He is not threatened by that. So really, there should be a mystery that you go, oh, death is here. Oh, what is God trying to unlock for me right now? What's going on here? What's happening here? Because God actually sent his son, and he conquered this thing called death. He did. He, he, he did it. He, he made an open show of these guys, made a shame of the grave, everything. Every grave should be embarrassed to have you around. Seriously. Every, every grave should be embarrassed by you showing up. I mean, it's like I've always said, Jesus ruined every funeral he went to, including his own. He ruined it. He goes, this sucks. That's, what, that's Barry's language. I'll, I have to interpret for Jesus. Everyone's like, this sucks. I'm raising everybody. You guys all right with this so far? But see, what happens is, and that's why we pray, because see, when the Holy Spirit hit Acts chapter 2, because, listen, again, creator of the universe, 12 guys, one's gone rogue. At the end of the day, they're all in a room, doors shut. And they're hiding. Wait a minute now. I thought you guys did exactly what Jesus, you know, you went into town two by two, man. You guys did some stuff. You guys did some stuff. And now you're hiding behind a door closed in your own house because your creator, your, your teacher was crucified. If your mind is not on the ultimate, it'll be distracted by the immediate. I'm done with that. It's not an easy thing to do. You can't come in here thinking that Bob's going to fix everything for you. That's not the Bob. That's not job. That's not the job of Bob. The, jo the job of Bob. <laughs> Sounds like a coffee drink or something. Java of Bob. I don't know. Okay. So we find ourselves not consuming the fresh revelation that is present. Listen, everything from God has to be revealed. The kingdom, now we're going to go to it, to grow God in you. Anybody interested in knowing how to grow God in you? Again, I am giving you things that is going to allow you to possess a greater depth of the kingdom. The byproduct is you may walk into some mental anguish because you have the right now to fight for the truth of who you are. Everybody said, Amen. The kingdom was never meant to be taught. It was meant to be consumed. I can't teach you the kingdom. I can't. I can reveal the kingdom, but it's up to you to consume it. I can present the food, but I can't force you to eat it. The original intent of the garden, destiny was determined by what they ate. Oof. I can only give you kingdom menus. I can only produce the food of him. Whether you study it and write a book about it, have classes about it, do seminars, let's have a men's men retreat, let's have a woman's retreat, that's not where it's at. That's simply the food that's presented whether you consume it or not determines the depth that you'll go in God. There's a lot of people that study the foods of God. Very few people know how to consume him. We've been adapted to, come on, Mark, pray for me. I got a problem. I got a problem. I got a problem. I got a problem, Mark. Pray for me. Pray for me. Next week, Mark, I got a problem. got a problem. 45 years later, Mark, I got a problem. got a problem. got a problem. What they realize is why they would come to him is because he's become what the kingdom is. And you're simply tapping him because you won't take the responsibility to consume of the king. You won't do it. So you run off the value of what he does in his fruitfulness when you're failing and you're, you're, you're being consumed by the value of what death wants to do to you. Listen, when this divine mind is understood, there will be no death, people. I'm telling you, there is no death. There is no death. The original guys that ran around the garden, that man and that woman in there, Jesus said, whatever you eat, freely eat. He, he goes, I'm not going to teach you about it. That's what you eat. 
This guy over here, this thing called the Revelation Knowledge of God, don't consume that. Now, you can teach on that thing, and you can pick up the fruit and play. You can juggle and throw baseballs and do all that kind of stuff. It's kind of like what we do with God. Take the word, just throw it around. Amen, brother. Hey, hallelujah. Hey, everybody's coming in. We just got it going on, man. We got like we got it going on. You need a word of the Lord. Let me see. Said, uh, yeah, I see you in the future. You know, we go, we go around. We're kicking some stuff around. Is that true or not true? It's true, isn't it? You know, it's, we're to the point, you know, when we pray in the spirit, hey, Lord, you see somebody coming in, say, hey, Lord, hey, Lord, hey, Lord, what's okay? Okay, you're working a gift. It's not necessarily coming from the food that you've consumed. Woo! I don't know if I'll ever be back here again. <laughs> My last meeting was at Dr. Bob's church. <laughs> So you realize, okay, there's something about consuming. What does this look like? Why was Jesus so bent? This guy was bent on saying he's the bread of life. Why is he using that? What are, why can't you just say, I am your life? Why are you using bread? What's with the bread thing? Why are you trying to make yourself food? Well, it seems like the original intent was your destiny was determined by what you ate. Think about it. I mean, think about it for a minute. Just think about this for a minute. These guys, this guy comes up to Jesus, hey man, woo! Let's see, let's, let, me, let me see some miracles. And Jesus goes, you're here because I multiplied the fish and the bread? Why don't you, what, drink my blood and eat my flesh? What the what? <laughs> Can't you, old great teacher, just teach me something? Why do you keep talking about eating you, drinking you? You're the bread of life. Your forefathers, Jesus says things in John chapter 6. He says, your forefathers ate of man in the wilderness. Listen to him. They died. They didn't die a spiritual death. They weren't spiritual to begin with. They had no way to be a new nature. He's talking a physical nature there. He's not talking, oh, you guys don't get eternal life. Too bad. You can have the manna and you don't get to come to heaven. That's not what he's saying. He goes, they ate of it. But they died. You eat of me, you'll never die. What are you talking about? Does that mean, okay, we got to go have a seminar on that. Dr. B needs to teach us. Oh, no, I'm not going to teach you anything. What I'm going to do is bring a spirit of revelation because that has to be revealed. It has to be revealed. Once it's revealed, amen. Now you have the right. Every revelation is an invitation to manifestation. Every revelation is an invitation to manifestation. So, listen to this now. You guys okay? Yeah. At, least, at least four people got it. Yeah, okay. I'm going to write, I'm going to say this to you. Uh, John, 6, 60, uh, John chapter 6, verse 63. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. Now, we're going to come back to that in a minute. We've heard that a million times, right? It's like I said before. When you are the fullness, I'm purposely going slow, because I could get going really fast, but I'm going to go slow. You've heard me say this, and now you're going to understand it in a new light. Because if you're hearing what's happening here, God wants to come in here as Lord God. I'm going to accelerate every seed that you've ever planted. You thought you were out without money all this time. All I've done is gain interest on what you planted. Anytime there's delay, there's always interest in the kingdom. Just remember that. God is always extra extravagant. He never goes backwards. He goes forward. Anytime there's delay, he's only adding interest to what you've deposited. Generally, it has to do with something with character that needs to be instilled in you to carry the weight of what he's about to give to you. Understand that? It's like the glory of God. He will not put the weightiness kabod of God in a place that cannot handle him. Because if you put something too heavy on the foundation, it'll crack it. It'll destroy it. He's smart. He's not dumb. So you can't call on the glory unless the foundation is prepared for it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when you are who God is, you know what happens? When you speak a word, 
and you're using God's word, God's word leaves your mouth. And it turns around and looks at you. And it says, is that God saying that? Or is that you? Because if it's just you, I'm not going to do it. See, people don't like to hear that. Well, I proclaimed his word. Didn't work, did it? Because God's word will protect the character of who God is. It's not going to cover your flawed character trying to exercise God's word. Now, there's many facets to that. I'm not saying that God's word doesn't work. I've seen people use it, but I'm going to tell you, at the end of the day, those words will turn around and look at you and say, why are you using God's word when it's not God speaking it? Because Satan does it all the time. Is that true or not true? All right, keep going. This is really good. This is really good. Nobody feel, you know, I could get hyped up and, you know, we can go, but it doesn't grow you. It's to, to not. What's the point? Right? I'm going to read you something. You're supposed to say, okay. <laughs> now everybody's... <laughs> if God tells you the outcome, he is guaranteeing that the outcome is going to be successful, meaning that God always puts a clear ending before he begins anything. God always clearly ends something before he begins it. The fact that you're here tells me you've been ended. That's really good. Therefore, it is not about the outcome because it's already been guaranteed. Please hear this, people. This is, this is, stuff, this is life. This will move really quickly when you get this. Therefore, the process is not about achieving the outcome, but the outcome that God gets out of you by being in the process of becoming Him. Because you have become as Him, it's the ability to end up at the outcome and not be ruined by it. It may, it's, this is what makes you rich. It's not reminding God of the outcome. You guaranteed this. You said, you said, you, how many said, you got to proclaim the end, you got to keep playing, you got to keep doing that. And God's going, it's already guaranteed. Why are you reminding me? My question to you is, why are you not being as me? That's the question. Therefore, be imitators of God. Does that make sense? The end is already guaranteed. Do you have the endurance? Do you have the stamina? Do you have the substance to stand? That's what he's trying to work into you. Well, I thought it was going to come and really going to get some stuff. You are getting some stuff. This is the mind of God. This is how God thinks. Wow. Pause. Just pause. Okay, let's go back to this again. The kingdom is not something that is learned, it's something that is consumed. Okay. See, many people want to learn about the kingdom. I've been told, oh, you're one of those uh, dominion people. What? Uh, you, you, you're in that dominion thing, right? Where you guys just get to take over the world and all that kind of stuff? Well, well, let me put it to you this way. It's, it's part of the original intent. You know, take dominion, be fruitful, multiply, take dominion, all that stuff. Yeah, but you guys just want to take, you think you're just going to take over everything. Well, it's not the ability to take over everything. It's the byproduct of being a king that you actually own everything. At the end of the day. That's what's going to happen. And they don't like that. They like the humble... I'm, I'm just a sinner. I'm, a, I'm a, of the Adamic race. See, you, when you understand all this stuff I'm telling you, you're just going, he has the mind of the fallen Adam. You're a dominionist. You're not going to make it. See you at the funeral. When you, go, when, you, when you go back to the Garden of Eden, God gave instructions not to eat. He didn't say not to learn. He said not to eat. See, it's going back to the original again. So let's go to Genesis chapter 2. It's warm in here. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat it, you shall what? Surely die. See, they could learn all about the tree of good and evil and not die. You can learn all you want about God, and you're going to die. 
because you didn't consume him. I, I, that's, a, that's a profound statement right there. You can have everything, you can, you can learn all you want about God, but until you consume him, you are going to die. Genesis chapter 3. Isn't it funny? What did God do? What, what did he protect when they fell? What did he protect? What did God protect? What did he protect? The tree of, the, of, 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 tree of life, actually. Tree, the tree of life. Why did he do that? Listen. Yeah, they would have been, what, forever in that state, okay? Based on what? Learning about it? Consuming it. Woo! You guys, listen. Reading the Bible, I'm going to tell you about these scriptures here. Blah, 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 blah. Wow, boom, 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 boom. I got, woo, you know the Bible. Wow, you really know the Bible. <laughs> I'm not impressed by that. I'm not. Because you have to understand, this, ca- this, this kingdom is supernatural. You speaking the word doesn't guarantee the supernatural. What guarantees the supernatural is from the food that you eat. It's from what you eat. That's what determines what you are. If you're studying it and just learning about it, you are worthless. You qualify to be the devil in the, in the, the desert to challenge the word. Because it's just words. That's all it is. Unless you eat meat. It starts off with eating. Listen, drink sincere milk. Paul's saying that. Why are, you just, why are you going back to drinking? What are you doing? He's going, you need to eat. Eat the meat. What does that look like? Sitting here learning about it? A little emphasis there. I was emotional there. For... So sorry. So sorry. Is this, are you, are you seeing where I'm coming from? Because I see a company of people that know the scripture, but they don't know the food. You probably want to know, how do you get the food, man? How do you get it? What are you doing? How do you, where's this food at? Wouldn't you like to know? I should just say, we're done. I'm shutting it down. I'll be back in a couple months. <laughs> That's it, nanner, nanner, nanner. In Jesus' name, amen. See, it's not, it's not what they learned about that killed the original couple. It's what they ate. It's what killed them. It's so good, man. It's, it's better than you saying amen. It's not about what you've learned of the kingdom. It's about what you've consumed of the kingdom. All right. I'm just getting started. I can amp it up and go a little fast. We'd be done by now if I was running at no more speed. You'd already be out sitting and having food, and you'd be at the table right now. Can I have some more butter, please? Coke over here, iced tea, what else? No, you're sitting here listening to me going, this guy is something else. What is this guy talking about? John 6, 48 says, I am the bread of life. Okay, let's just start looking at this now. Can we just go there? You guys excited about this? I mean, is anybody else? I am trying to, I, listen, I'm going to make you so fat from eating the food of the kingdom that death has no way to even become part of your menu. Is that okay? Yeah. If you, if you, if you, Let's just go there. Now, we can go into Hyundai, Shondai. We could do that. But that's just exercising a gift. It doesn't grow you by, by consuming stuff. You've you got to consume some stuff. So, John 6, 40 says, I am the bread of life. You know what's so funny about where Jesus was born from? Where was he born from? What was the town called? You know what it means? House of bread. Gee, you would think, okay, let's start... Pay attention now, people. It doesn't say the house of gifts. House of prophecy. House of healing. House of deliverance. He goes with this thing called bread. What? what? There he goes again. He starts with bread. Food. Woof. You just go, okay. There's some stuff here. I'm not going to get into these other notes I have. It's just too deep. Okay, moving along. <clears throat> it's just too deep. You can handle it? We'll see. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I got some stuff here. 
It, 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 it's, it's amazing. You guys, can I go? Uh, I just saw a bunny take off. Do you want me to chase it or not? <laughs> if I chase it, I'm going to kill it. So that's up to you. <laughs> bunny takes off. I'm going to kill the bunny. Somebody's tuning in. Killing bunnies? What? What's this guy talking about? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's. Do you remember the. the when, I don't want to, I'm going to see if I can frame this right so I can get it done in, in a very short amount of time so you can catch the flavor of what I'm trying to say here because this bunny's running. Okay, here we go. I'm just going to bring this out because somebody needs to hear this. That's why it's in the atmosphere. So what happens is, is you realize there are things that happen to us in the winds of death is that there's a mystery that's present. How many remember that when uh, Jacob was with Leah and she was beginning to birth Benjamin, what happened? As she was beginning to birth, um, did I say Rachel? I said right, not Leah. I said that right? Rachel. Rachel. Yeah. I said, right? In Jesus' name, amen. She knows. <laughs> she's going to take the mic and she's going to teach. Yes. So you realize that when she was dying, she named him Son of Sorrow. Okay. What happened? High anguish. Mental torment, I don't know why this is happening to me, the winds of death are blowing, I'm going to name this the son of my sorrow. All right? So you realize, okay, so, so then what happens? Father, te she's teaching. Dad says, no, son of my right hand, his name shall be called Benjamin. Okay? If you follow that through, Benjamin, the first king of Israel, was from the tribe of Benjamin. Queen Esther was from Benjamin. You start seeing governmental authority that begins to go off of something because somebody in a moment of anguish discerned it rightly so that the governance of the kingdoms could be established. Does this make sense? There's things that happen that you just go, I don't understand why it's happening, but you better keep your mind right and name the thing of what is supposed to be named so God can get his job done through you. Does that make sense? I mean, you got to think about this whole thing. Um, yeah, Jacob, I mean, come on, this is, high, this is high emotion here, man. This guy loved this woman. He, he spent 14 of his years of his life working for the value of this lady, now his wife. And she doesn't get to spend one minute with him and this newborn, not one. That's high emotion. That situation's high. And she's, she's, she's pushing with all she can to birth a governance, but she's caught in the moment by the winds of death and wants to name what death wants to name it. Yeah, if you pay attention and somebody's navigating emotional intelligence, they name it, this is no, 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 no. This is the son of my right hand. Interesting enough, if you follow that through a little bit further, I'm making sure this rabbit's dead. Funny enough, it's Judah and Benjamin. Benjamin is, is, is when um, Joseph ends up in front of Pharaoh's court, right? Or he's in, prime minister, and all of a sudden, here come the brothers. And he's vying for Benjamin. Who tries to save him? Ruben. Judah. Yeah. <laughs> you go to the back of the row. You, back of the building. Eh, wrong answer. Da, da. What is the jeopardy? Da, da. You're, no, no, I'm sorry. So Judah, yeah, that'll be next week's class. We'll go through that. But you begin to see that Judah ends up being the substitute. He wants to be the substitute. So you've been seeing Jesus is now wants to be the substitute. He's going to come in and pay for everything. There's a whole thread that goes through the Bible like that. It's, it's very powerful to understand that. Okay. I know. That's why I said I got to... I don't know if I should go on this because it's deep stuff. I mean, you could spend a whole service just on unlocking the value of what's happening here. Okay, so let's go through the Lord's Prayer or the Disciples' Prayer real quick because we're pushing time and it's pushing the sleep buttons on some people. So here's what happens. What's the Lord's Prayer? How's it go? Give us this day our, oh, our what? 
give us our daily teaching. Come on, I need another cassette. I need an MP3. I need something. I need something. I need something. That's not what he says. He's teaching them to be, you better be able to consume something. Fresh revelation. You better have that. You better be able to hear what God is saying. And you're going, wow, this is starting to make sense now. It's really starting to take, take a new shift on how I perceive certain things. Matthew 26, I'm going to accelerate a little bit so I can not have you here for another 16 hours. Because if I get going, that'll be the end of all of us. <laughs> exactly. Um, Matthew 26, 26, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread. There he goes again. He blessed it and he broke it. And gave it to the disciples to take this, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many of the remissions of sins. Okay. It's, it's, it's a very powerful thing to reinforce now what I'm saying, so I'm just going to accelerate. There's some other stuff i got. i got all kinds of rabbits in these notes. Rabbits everywhere. Okay, we're going to forget that. I'm going to just reinforce what I said earlier, John chapter 6, so you just know that I'm not making this stuff up. John chapter 6, 48 says this, I am the bread of life. There he goes to emphasizing that. It's in the Lord's Prayer. He keeps telling them I'm the bread. And he goes, you're a father's eight of the man in the wilderness, and they are dead. You know what was so funny about that? They didn't have any faith. They didn't have, no faith was required to die. You do what you want with that. That's a, that's a, that's a mystery is. This is bread that comes down from heaven that one may eat it and may not die. What does he mean by that? Does that really mean what it says? Come on now. Does it really mean what it says? Then quit. If, is death in our enemy? Yes or no? Then why would you negotiate with it? Okay, I'm just giving that out for free. I'm the bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, God, there you go again. Yeah, I get taught about how to make bread. Do I get to take pictures of the bread? No, it's whoever eats of this thing. He will live forever. That's a heavy statement, people. Ah, well, no, no, the scripture says right here, man's appointed to die one time. Well, look at your ignorance. <laughs> if you take it in context, that's not what he's saying there. What he's saying there is, I'm going to die one time for all the sins of humanity. That's what it means. Because if he said if man's only appointed one time, then I'm going to ask you, how many times did Lazarus die? He died twice. Well, that would break God's word. If he broke God's word, we wouldn't be here. We'd be vaporized. Because God's word would fall apart and everything in a molecular structure would just fall apart. We wouldn't be here. So what does it really mean? It means what it says it means. That's what it means. That's what it means. This is the bread which came down from heaven, verse 58. Not as your fathers ate of the manna and are dead. He keeps hitting that button, man. Guys, come on. Don't teach. Don't take the teachings about me. Consume me. Consume me. How do you do that? Because we're all sitting here, you're going, how do you do that? You want to know the practicality of it, don't you? Because it drives you nuts. Hey, that's really good, Dr. B, but give me something to work with. Okay, there's two sides of that coin. There's a part of Revelation, I can't teach you how to get it. It has to be revealed. There is no know-how. I can't give you Revelation, only God can. I can tell you there's a Revelation present. I can speak from Revelation, but for your own self, that's up to you. I don't have a, a know-how, go-how, because I am not your stomach. If you're hungry for the value of him, he's going to feed you. What does that look like? Because we're going to close it out here really quick, so I'm going to give you a the beginning of many sermons. Is that okay? Yes. John chapter 4. This is when it begins to unfold. It begins to unlock. Because, listen, I figured out a long time ago, it's not about how much you know about the Scripture. Nothing to do with it. Because I realized, gosh, Satan is standing in front of the Word itself, and he's using the Word against the Word. That's so the, what's up with that? One is food, one isn't. One's an imitation, the other one's the real thing. There's a counterpart and a counterfeit. Jesus was a counterpart to the Father. Satan was a counterfeit. Using the same words, one was a counterpart of God, the other one was a counterfeit. Everybody in this room, guess what? You have the privilege to be the counterpart of God. Say this, I am, I am the, counterpart the counterpart of God. Of God. I will, I will never, never forget, that. forget that. Yeah, see, you've got to... When, 
when the Holy Spirit, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, when it says, be you filled with the Spirit, right? When you're filled with the Spirit, there's no other Spirit that can get in there. No spirit of doubt, fear, unbelief. None of that can get in there. That's another teaching. How do you stay filled, right? How do you do that? John chapter 4. You say I'm there when you're there. He's like this. I'm there. (laughs) A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. I'm going to have to move you back into the <laughs> cry room. <laughs> We're going to have to have you in the cry room. Then we have a room that has the electrical panel and it has a door. We'll have to probably put you in there. A woman of Samaria, listen to this now. Listen to the verbiage of this. Came to draw water. Jesus, I'll go ahead and just finish it for you. It's okay, I got it. Jesus said to her, because I'm reading right from the scripture. Give me a drink. Listen to this now. Now here it comes. Here comes, here comes reality. For his disciples had gone into the city to buy food. Pay attention. Now if he's the bread of life, why are you going to buy food? That's, that's how I think. What's going on here? What's, what's going to be revealed here in this moment? So the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you... Though you're a Jew and you're asking me for a drink, though I'm a Samaritan woman, I won't get into all the semantics about that. You know, Jews don't associate with Samaritans. But Jesus replied to her, God, clearly she was taught, I'm a Samaritan, I don't roll with you. But here is the creator of the world in front of a woman, and he's just saying, you give me a drink. He's trying to lay a foundation here. You've got to watch what's in his mind. What's going on? I'm, I'm going to feed, Rodney. I'm going to feed. I'm going to feed everybody that's around. I'm going to, I'm going to, they've got to get this concept. Jesus replied, if you knew the gift of God and who it was is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Dude, what are you talking about? So she's cocked her head now. You know how dogs look at you and they kind of kiss their head like that? That's what she's doing. What? Going natural now. She's trying to figure it out. She said to him, Sir, you have no bucket. See? See? See, when you're, not in, the, when you're in the natural, you've got to discern something that's revelation. It's not going to work. There is no logic in the kingdom. Zero. I want you to understand that. There is no logic in the kingdom. Zero. There is no logic in the kingdom. It's zero. Oh, you don't believe me? Why don't you go gather some empty jars, just gather a bunch of nothing, and I'm going to cancel your debt. Yeah, right. How do you want to move this nothing into everything? There is no logic in the kingdom. Zero. We just peel the bark off the sticks and we just throw it there. And we just become spotted. All the goats, all the sheep. There is no logic in the kingdom. Zero. That's why it's so difficult because we go like this. Listen to me, people. We think we've got to build up a bunch of faith to make something happen. And God is smart enough to go, you can't have faith unless you eat me first. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. You know what that makes? That makes him a person. That means that faith is a person. It's not a thing. It's a person. It also turns into a category. You can have a category of faith because you've been with the person of faith really good, Dr. Barry. You should have stopped at about 20 minutes ago. I'm still running. I'm still... That first rabbit you killed, that just shook me up. Okay. (laughs) Sir, there's no bucket. How many times do you try to figure stuff out? And you're just going, that doesn't make any sense. How do you do that? I try to talk about it. Give me a drink. Dude, you don't even have a bucket. She's talking to the creator of the universe. That's just funny to me. You don't even have a bucket, man. Like, who are you? Hilarious. 
You are not greater than our father Jacob. Hilarious. Are you? Who gave us this well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle. Jesus has said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. Man, he's just brilliant. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him shall never be thirsty. But the water that I give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up eternal life. The woman said, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty, nor come all the way if I'm understanding you here to draw water anymore. Down to verse 29. She goes, she goes and tells, you know, what's going on and, you know, about the husband's things and all that stuff. Verse 29, she runs into town. She says this, come see a man who told me all the things that I've done. Okay? That's not logical, people. You, you meet some dude at the well, tells you all these dudes you've been living with, been married to, and, and the guy you're living with, that's not, you know, this, this, is, this is a mess. This guy already knew this. He's talking about eating and drinking all this stuff. I, I don't get it, but he told me everything. I, 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 this guy's great. Pay attention now. Watch this now. Here we go. We're going to close her down. Come see this man who told me of all the things that I've done. This is, is, not, this, is, is not the Christ, is he? They left the city and were coming to him. Here come the disciples. All the gagging in from town. They got, they got the loot now. They got the food. We went to, uh, we went to Arby's. Got the Arby's. <laughs> we got the Yiro. What would you want? You had that other thing. What was that? I forget what that's called. Yeah, Chick-fil-A. Okay. <laughs> Listen to it now. Listen to the clue. This is the hidden mystery here. They left the city and were coming to him. And they seen, meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food. to eat that you do not know about. Uh-oh. Got their attention. So the disciples were saying one to another, no one brought him anything to eat. Did they? I mean, how could he talk like that? I mean, we went into town for the food thing, right? I mean, what? they're going like, this is logic now, kicking in. Now, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, uh, 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 did he, what? Jesus said, listen to me now. Here's the beginning of the next 15 sermons. My food... Listen to what he identifies as food. is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish it. Stop. Stop. Stop, 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 stop. You know what that tells me? If you don't know the will of what you're supposed to be doing, you're going to die because you're not eating the right food. If you know the purpose and the will of what God has for you, you eat of me and you'll never die. John chapter 11, 25, 26, same thing. I'm the resurrection and I am the life. Though you believe in me and you die, I'm resurrection to you. But if you believe in me and you, what, live as me, you'll never die. Do you believe this? I've got it so slow now, I'm a lullaby. <laughs> Dr. Fizer, I think, wrote this, and I'll end with this, not on a grand, spectacular note of the heavens opening up and having spectacular manifestations in the next minute. It may happen in the, after that minute. The kingdom was never meant to be taught in order to do God's will. Kingdom was meant to be consumed. Catch it. One's taught, the other one is consumed, so you can become God's will. When you become the will of God, doing the will will become first the will become first nature. The kingdom will not allow us to keep our life and his life at the same time. Woo, that's pretty good. When you become the will of God, doing the will will become first nature. The kingdom will not allow us to keep our life and him at the same time. One must lose their life in order to find it. Matthew 10, 37 through 39. Sometimes 
You will not know the full cost of the kingdom dream until you're confronted with something that the heart has grown to love and has embraced as a need for its own fulfillment. Patience, indeed, must have its perfect work in you. If there's a delay, don't question God's nature. God's trying to work his nature into you. The value of understanding God's will is what he goes by. This is my food. This is what I live by. I don't need natural food in order to sustain this natural life. I'm going supernatural. Everything in the kingdom is supernatural. In order to have supernatural outcome, you're going to have to have a mind of a supernatural God. And a natural supernatural God could care less if there's a Red Sea and there's a two million army behind you about ready to kill you. He doesn't even consider it. He says, here, lift the rod. Listen to me. Whatever's in your hand right now, God's not going to give you anything more than what's the distance between your chest and how far your arm can go out. Where do I get that? How far did Moses have to raise the value of who he was? This far. Raise it up. You already got it. Use it. Get into the value that you have become as he is. You simply do the will of the Father. And he says, that's my food. That's what you go by. And then you begin to realize, oh my gosh, I already have this seed inside of me. He goes, yeah, all this time you've been sitting there listening, being taught, but you never consume me. He's saying, do you know? Do you know? Come on. Do you know? He's going, ah. You do you know the will of what's for your life? Once you get into the purpose of that, God says, man, I've got storehouses you don't know of. Man, I got a life for you. You don't even understand the value of what you are in me or me and you and all that stuff that comes with that. You need to understand that. So what does he have to do? He has to bring the gift of prophecy. He's got to come in the room. I'm the testimony of prophecy. You don't quite get it yet, but I'm going to tell you your clear ending. I'm not telling you because it's, I'm already guaranteeing the success of what you're supposed to be. Quit telling me about the end. Become the end. Don't learn more about what you're supposed to do. Learn about what you're supposed to become. Consume the will of the Father. That is my meat. Listen to me. You don't get taught into the reality. You get fed into that reality. That's why you, it's so important to be under the spirit of revelation. You get under the spirit of teacher, you're going to get confused. You know the word, but you can't understand why it doesn't, why it doesn't fulfill you. Why does it, where is there no substance? Why, what's going on here? There are millions of charismatics that are lost to the will, but they are fully enveloped in their gift. Woo! I just said something. The gift is free. It takes nothing to develop it. It's just given to you. No food required. The kingdom has to be consumed. It cannot be taught. It was never meant to be taught. You don't say, well, it says here Jesus went around teaching about the things of the kingdom. You know what he's doing? He's demonstrating it. He's saying, I heard the will of my father. I only do what I see my father do. See, he's seeing the will. That's his food. From that food, he demonstrates. Whew. I hope you heard something I had to say. I hope you did. I hope you understand what God's doing in this house. It may seem like it's really sleepy and warm in here. But there's more revelation of truth. There's a dew point that God's calling for. Remember when I taught over here about dew point? You understand? I'm going to just remind you really quick. There's a dew point in this atmosphere right now. It's filled with the glory of God. It's filled with every goodness of God that you could ever imagine or think. But how dew works is that you have to get to a certain temperature to reveal what has always been there. When you always hear the weatherman say, and the temperature dew point is 62 degrees. That means you're not going to see Jack until 62 when you fly as a pilot, you've got to find out what's the temperature dew point, especially if you're a VFR pilot. You want to know what dew point is because this is, when dew point hits, it's foggy. You're not going to see nothing, and you're going to fly that plane in the ground. That's what you're going to do. So you've got to know where's the dew point. There's something you have to, first of all, be aware this, this atmosphere is charged. There's been decades of labor from every one of you, labor to get here. Every sum total of everything you've ever done at this moment is happening right now. And God's saying, I'm coming as Lord God. I'm going to bring the acceleration of everything you've ever done. This is not a time of delay. This is a time of acceleration. This nation needs to be accelerated. Satan's trying to delay and trying to destroy it. And God's going to say, no, I got another one. I am the Lord of the harvest. And if you've got a bad seed in you, you're going to drop. You got a seed of God in you, you're going to accelerate. That's how it works. And you've got to know and understand how the Lord God works. 
please go under, go get that book and read it because you'll bring some fruition or bring some things, a reality that will accelerate the fruition of the seed that you've planted all these years because it will erase this delay. If you understand delay, like I said, it's interest. How do you know that? Because the Lord of Harvest pays really well. He doesn't deduct because there's a delay. He's adding two because there's a delay. And you'll find out at the end of the day, it's not the delay of him, it's the delay of us of understanding him. I, I found out a long time ago, and it, it makes me angry because I always get, sometimes when I get to new realities of God, I go, really? I realize I don't know nothing because I don't. I just, don't, I know a little bit about him. But there's places I go, it's not an easy thing to do, people. I'll be the first to admit, it is not easy to do. It's not easy. Is it doable? 100%. And when you understand that, the value of the Lord of the harvest, he comes in, the seed you planted, it is now yours. You can have the fullness of it. So I'm here to encourage you. The Lord of the harvest is here. He wants you to write down what do you want accelerated. Let me know. You want to grow in me? Consume me. How do you do that? The beginning of his understanding his will. Oh, that's a process to understand that. Maybe I'll come back. God bless you guys. Man, I love being here. We'll see you next time. That was great, wasn't it? <laughs> wow. I'm so glad you mentioned the Lord of the Harvest because Bob has mentioned on more than one occasion that he was uh, one time in a group of pastors and Oral Roberts was there and they uh, were planting seeds and Oral Roberts came to him and said, did you name your seed? And he, he said, he, Bob said, I did it immediately. Well, I had an opportunity, it's such an honor, but in 2006, I had lunch with Oral Roberts, my wife and I did. And he told a story. After he had retired, he had moved into this place and they were um, turning it into condos. And he was either gonna have to move out or buy it. And he didn't have enough for the down payment. But God showed him that he's the Lord of the harvest. And when he's planting his seed, he's planting it to the Lord of the harvest. And he needed, uh, well, he needed $100,000 for the down payment, but the entire cost of it was $420,000. And he, just that little change there that I'm planting my seed to the Lord of the harvest Within 18 months, he was able to pay off the entire $420,000, and nothing had changed in his finances except the mentality that he was planting his seed to the Lord of the harvest. We have an opportunity right now to plant our seeds to the Lord of the harvest. And just like Oral Roberts told Bob, name your seed. I've already given right now. And we, there's three options here as we're giving today. You can bring your tithes and offerings, make your checks out to the gathering place. If you're giving to Soaring Ministries, you can do that. Or if you want to give to, to Barry, plant a seed in his great ministry. Just check the box. There it says guest speaker. And if you're giving at home or if you're giving online, there's a little drop-down menu there. Same thing. You can either check for Soaring Ministries, the gathering place, or the guest speaker. So, um, those of you that are taking the offering, come ahead and uh, do that, and let's, uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are the Lord of the harvest, that you're compressing time, and those seeds that have been sown, Lord, they're coming to fruition, they're coming to harvest, and we thank you for that. And so, Jesus, we ask now you would take our offering and present it to the Father. May it be a sweet savor in his presence. Amen and amen. Now, next week, next Saturday, we're going to have another special guest speaker, and this is Charlie Jordan. A lot of you will remember him. He was bass player for Kim Clement for many, many years. He will be here. He'll also be helping us in leading of worship, and we're looking forward to that. All right, let me speak this blessing over you and those of you that are at home. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. I bless you now 
in the name of the Lord God, the Lord of the harvest. Amen and amen.